Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video. This is a frontline update for the Ukraine war uh, for the 10th of February 2023. Uh, let's get straight to it or at least let's go to a couple of discussion points from the Institute for the Study of War that are worthy of mention. Wagner Group financier Yegevny Prigozhin has announced uh, yesterday that the Wagner Group has entirely stopped recruiting prisoners. What does this mean? Does this mean that they were struggling to get the prisoners and thought there was a bit of a no-go? Has the Russian military, as some saying, dipped into that pot uh, and kind of stopping PMC, the Wagner PMC doing that? Is this a sign that the Wagner PMC are going to be taking less and less of a part in this war because the Russian MOD is establishing its kind of primacy on the front line, I don't know, and well, not necessarily on the front line, but behind the scenes, actually. I don't know. So interesting things going on there. Something else that I think is, is worthy of note is that Sergei Shoigu, the um, Russian defense minister, appears to be embroiled in a procurement scandal rather similar to the one that uh, has involved... Uh, some personnel in the administration in Ukraine uh, so charged being paying huge, hugely overpriced um, prices for uh, procurement, for inferior quality equipment, so on and so forth. So it'd be interesting to see what happens there because actually some of the mill bloggers are being fairly critical of this and at the same time, the Kremlin continues to show that it's unwilling to curb divisive rhetoric from ultra-nationalist pro-war figures and mill bloggers. So just uh, there seems to be this infighting, and yet they allow some of it to to, to continue, which kind of is, is odd, I guess, uh, considering the autocratic authoritarian nature of uh, Russia. Anyway, let's go to the northeast sector, which is Kupiansk, Stantos, Svatova to Kremlin. Let's go actually to the uh, shelling first of all. So shelling seems to the, there's an uptick in the northern Luhansk area in the in the Kupiansk area, and a little bit further south. So there, there's an uptick there, uh, and as you can imagine, uh, along basically the entirety of the front line in Luhansk, and a little bit as well in um, Zaporizhia. So it's fairly tasty around there too. Uh, so that's the shelling. Defmon, who is a pro-Ukrainian source, says in the Svatova area, the Ukrainians have repulsed an attack in the area of Stelmakivka, mainly positional battles in the area, no significant change. Uh, doesn't really talk about anywhere near Kupiansk. Rebar, pro-Russian source, says basically nothing about the in the Starobil direction, which is what it calls the sort of fat of a front line. There are no significant changes to in the front line. Artillery duels and positional fighting continue along the line of contact. Something that has been claimed for the last few days is that Sinkivka has been taken by the Russians. Here, Global War Monitor says, Russia claims to have recaptured the village of Sinkivka north of Kupiansk. Uh, which was liberated by the Ukrainians on the 20th of November. Okay, let's go to my map. Well, I don't have that on my map. I was, I was saying there were rumours about this the last couple of days, uh, but Sinkivka itself appears not to have been uh, taken, as according to most other sources. So it's odd to see where where exactly this has come from. Syriac, who are pro-Russian mappers, are fairly accurate, have said during the last six days the Russian army has taken control of some parts of Kriani Kivka. And moreover, troops entered in Liman Pershi town and reached the outskirts of Sinkivka. This is bizarre for a couple of reasons because I've had Liman Pershi is under Russian control for ages. And they're saying, well, Russians have got through that town and, and reached the Sinkivka borders, the edge of Sinkivka. Uh, odd. So they've actually got that as a as an increase for Russian controlled area there. Uh, I already had that, but they do have this increase uh, of Russian control and territory in just to the north there in Kirani Kivka. Now, I talked to you the other day about the railway line being the line of defense up here, and that was kind of holding true all along this area uh, from that you see. It's basically that's the railway line goes through there. Uh, if they've broken across, if the Russians have indeed broken across there, that is fairly significant. I've not heard it anywhere else, but I'm fairly trusting of Suryak at the moment. They seem to be fairly accurate uh, as as to what the Russians are doing. Uh, seems to be the case when Russia do well, pro-Russian mappers are fairly accurate. When Ukraine does well, uh, pro-Ukrainian mappers are fairly accurate. Anyway, as we go further down, nothing particularly um, 
interesting to of note that has happened the russians are pressuring all over but there just doesn't seem to be much detail coming out of the out of here as for sure there's going to be a lot of activity from ploshchanka down to kremlin but yeah not not hearing too much about it as we come down to the Kremlin area, uh, Defmon says the Ukrainians have repulsed attacks in the area of Bilirivka and Vimivka. Vimka, sorry. Uh, fighting is ongoing in the Kremlin Dobrova direction. Satellite images indicate previous mentions of attacks in the area of Ship Livka were most likely Russians trying to advance to the grey area along the river. So this is, I'm going to actually show you this because it is of some interest. Uh, you've got Bilirivka here, which is holding out and is super important to keep hold of uh, Sever. So let's just put this all into context. Bilirivka here is very important to uh, for allowing Severs to remain in, in Ukrainian hands. Bilirivka goes, then you can see the Russians advancing through the Serebryansky forest. Um, but yeah, fighting around Dobrova and along along the river here, but just north of Bilirivka is what Defmon is saying. Um, so we go back to his map along the river. This is the Seversky Donetsk River, uh, and there there is fighting there. So you can see that. Uh, there will be pressure around Belarivka. He goes on to say the intentions of the Russians in this area is to force a Ukrainian retreat from Tversk and improve positions for a future attack on Slovyansk. So just to give you an idea of what he's saying here, this is precisely what I was saying the last few days. Tversk is there. You've got uh, Bakhmut just down south here. Uh, but they are forcing themselves, this is Solodar, sort of forcing themselves up through Fedorivka and Rozdolivka here towards Seversk at the same time trying to do their offensive down from Kremina through Torska, Zorichina and across the Kherovets River and to give a large encirclement of uh, Seversk and then that would then allow them to, to leapfrog on to attack Slovyansk. Of course, if they want the D Donbass, this is exactly what they need to do. Whether they are going to be able to do that with the forces that they have is a completely different question. No reports doesn't really say anything about Kremina, uh, and uh, really nor does Rebar, which is all quite surprising. It's um, all more about uh, Bakhmut and further down south. Just to give you a little bit of context, heavy fighting around Kremina is ongoing north of Dobrova. Fighting is extremely heavy right now. Russian VDV, that's the airborne units, are trying to force a breakthrough uh, towards Yampolivka. I'll show you that on a map in a second, but this is an example of the sorts of fighting that is going on at the moment. Um, and that is, uh, yep, taking place in the Dobrova area towards Yampolivka. So you've got Dobrova here, you've got Yampolivka up there, Dobrova there. So this kind of uh, westward push of the Russians in to the west and to the northwest of Kremlin, as well as to the southwest. Okay, let's uh, move on slightly further down south. Now, I'm uh, just going to show you an odd bit of Ukrainian gained territory, as according to Syriac maps. But that uh, footage of the Terminator BMP, that that sort of updated uh, infantry fighting vehicle with the auto cannons and and bits and pieces on top, that was somewhere south, eight kilometers south of Kremlin, so probably in this forest area there. But as we come down to uh, Z Z Zolotarivka. Here, the Ukrainians apparently have taken back a bit of um, a bit of land, as according to Syriac map. So, uh, Ukrainian army recaptures some positions west of Zolotar uh, Zolotarivka, uh, town uh, at the border between Luhansk and Donetsk Oblast. So, th that is a rare bit of Ukrainian gain for the moment in this time of uh, Russian offensives. So, there you go. There it is on my map. As we come down further south to Bakhmut area. Uh, there is somewhat stabilized, perhaps, but they are, the Russians are still making incremental gains, and those gains are in a number of different places. So, for example, if we look north here, they've made some gains just north of this uh, Sako Ivan Seti uh, village towards Fedorivka. So they are they are they are pushing all over the shop. 
Institute for the Study of War will mention all the places around the Bakhmut. Uh, Def Mon will say, you know, Repulsa Tax, Fedorivka, uh, Bakhmut, Krasnohora, Paris, Kavivka, Ivaniska, Chassiv Yar, uh, so on and so forth. So there, there are there are lots of attacks going on. Um, Rebar says, in a Solidar direction sector, north of Bakhmut, Wagner assault units took fortifications around Paris, Kavivka. Russian forces reached Bakhmut Slavyansk Highway. Uh, and fighting continues in Paris Kavivka itself, along with Krasnohora. This is the claim that as we come a little bit further down south, and I've kept the Ukrainian lines there just to give you a sense of the advance of the Russians over the last few days. They've advanced down this uh, little sort of low point, this gully, if you like, towards this road. And the claim the claim is from some that they are at this road, uh, others that they're pretty much next to it, but. I, I guess it doesn't really matter. That road is not b going to be used at all. It is far too close to Russian lines. And there has been some gains around Paris Kavivka just here. Um, and Krasnohora is you know, looking more and more surrounded as the days go by. So further gains all around this area. Only you know incremental gains, but nonetheless, you can feel the, the closing in of the um of the net if you like uh for, for that area as we come further down south uh, we have the eastern suburbs so there's that report then that actually some of the the eastern area there's been some recaptured area whether that's blocks streets i'm not sure i haven't heard too much detail other than that which is the um, no report saying in Bakhmut itself, the situation fairly stable. In Zabamutka, in the east, certain parts have been recaptured. To the south, Russian troops, they are no longer Wagners, Wagners, but spearheaded by the Russian elite troops, have not yet managed to break through to Ivaniska. Uh, the Ukrainian knows the plan. Ukrainians know the plan. Um, let's just have a have a little look at the uh, east there. So this is a Zabamutka area, and we have seen the Uk Russians advance street by street each day. Um, I don't have the exact details. Sorry, my fingers aren't really good today. Of where every day, uh, of where the uh, the troops are, where the exact lines are. Certain maps will have the Russians f slightly further forward, uh, and in these kind of middle streets here, I I've sort of put it back to what Deep State had. Um, but they are pressing all around there, as you would imagine. I haven't heard too much about the south over the last few days, to be honest. But it, there is some activity over here towards Ivaniska. So Syriac Maps has the most recent mapping. I mean, uh, Defmon Yesay, who's a pro-Russia, a pro-Ukrainian source, says uh, that continued efforts by the Russians to advance towards the M03 and T0504 roads north and south of Bakhmut. I believe the attacks around Zalizhnansky have been limited. So just to let you know that that's uh, to the west of Blad Datni, that sort of salient they've made down to it. So he doesn't have them nearly as close to the road as, as I do. Uh, so just to let you know um, on my map exactly where that is. So I have here this the salient of the Russians coming down there. Uh, he doesn't really have that. So here he says that the you know the lines are back there, whereas I say they're right next to this this road. Uh, and then further down south, uh, he does he doesn't have them very close to this road either. Uh, this the Stupochki to Ivaniska road. Whereas I have actually just changed mine to go in line with Suryat maps that are saying actually they have reached that road now. But bear in mind these are Russian claims uh, that this road here is, is reached and they've made some inroads to this high ground, these aggregates that I said that actually I wasn't sure the Russians controlled. So I've moved my lines back now. I've moved it forward. Suryat maps, for example, saying that the... Uh, Russian forces and DPR have advanced west and north of the water channel towards the villages to Pochki, uh, thus cutting physically cutting the H32 road. Uh, that is within the last hour. They, they've they produced that. In fact, all their maps have come out in the last hour, really. So there's definitely movement here uh, to the south of Bakhmut around Iv Ivaniska. If Ivaniska falls, then you're in trouble. As long as that can still get some kind of, you can see there's some perhaps smaller roads maybe coming out of there. If they can still get 
supply into Ivanivska through uh, this road from Bakhmut and from Bakhmut through this main supply route into the west of Bakhmut, then Ivanivska has a good chance of, of holding out. They need that to hold for Bakhmut to hold, really. That, that presently, from, in my opinion, is the key. A uh, war map, a map, it's just a nice clear, clear map. Um, although I think it takes them a, a little bit of time to, to get stuff updated. I would say this area in the Krasnohora um, sector has, has, has been, um, you know, impinged upon by the Russians there. They are, they're moving that net further and further in and uh, not nearly as close to uh, areas around here by Ivanivska and to the south as I think the Russians probably are. Just before I do so, I just want to show you some of the maps that Defmon started using, which are particular satellite images that show shelling and gives you an idea of where the troops most probably are given the uh, sites of, of shelling. So it appears that the Russians have reached sort of here and here because that's where you see, see this concentration of artillery fire that's, that's hemming the Russians in and keeping them back. As you can see here, along all these sort of junctions where you're going to get movement of troops more likely, um, you know, the edges of, of the fields and the hedgerows, I say junctions, you know, these are probably paths and hedgerows. You see the heavy, heavy shelling there that gives you an idea uh, of, yeah, where the Russian troops are. Anyway, I just thought that that's of interest. And then, yeah, we're going to move down to Avdivka. Uh, let's look at that on my map. A few things to say about Avdivka. So there we have it. Now, Syriac map, map, uh, the pro-Russian map, sorry, Syriac maps, has a slight increase in Russian territory just north of Opitny uh, towards Avdivka in that southern area. But it's worth referring to Igor um, Gherkin, I think this comes from. Uh, it, this is Andrew Perpetua pointing out uh, in the translation. So this is what he says about Avdivka. Uh, talking interestingly in this first part about how they are, they have assimilated the militias into the Russian army and renamed them sort of Russian Federation Army rather than uh, DPR, uh, Donetsk People's Republic. So without supporting them with either artillery fire, which was extremely inaccurate, so that's an interesting point, or armoured vehicles, which were protected from mines. And it was not possible to clear the area for technical reasons, so they couldn't support them with artillery or or uh, armoured vehicles, they killed two more companies of assault infantry and the same result as before, that is, to no avail. Andrew Perpetua says that he's heard it's actually three companies, and that's what I reported yesterday. So three companies could be anywhere from between, depends how many you fit in a company, but so anywhere between 300 and 1,000 troops, right? So it could be 100 to 150 in a company or more. So you basically got just a whole load of troops dying in that Avdivka area. And that seems to be uh, borne out by what Igor Strelkov is saying here, e e Evil Gherkin. Okay, it's not looking good for them there, although they have made some slight gains, it appears, in the Opitny area. Uh, Defmon says, the yeah, if you repulse attacks in the area of uh, Novokalinova, uh, Vodyanya, Povomaisky, Veseli, Krasnoharivka, and Avdivka, you, Russians had minor progress in the Vodyanya area recently. I believe they will try to progress north uh, to Olivka to be able to affect the Avdivka supply route. Let's have a look at what that means. So I've said they made some gains in this Opitny area. He's saying that actually there's some movement towards Vodyanya. This is exactly right. So there's been this activity towards Sverna for some time, for a good week or so, to try and push up there to Tonyenke, to Olivka. But these are, you know, quite heavily fortified places. And uh, the, the Ukrainians have been here for a very long time. So it's going to be difficult for the Russians to make too much progress, I would think. Defmon compares Bakhmut to Avdivka. So the Bakhmut situation looks about the same as the Avdivka situation. So comparing the two on the maps, you've got these two uh, surrounded or partially encircled settlements that, that really do look quite sa similar there. Uh, and he said, which makes me look a little bit more positive on the Bakhmut defence. The Ukraine, the Russians have been trying to encircle Avdivka for years without success. And that's absolutely true. So we'll move on to Mariinka. So in Mariinka, we've had this situation where you've got the 
the centre of the town being contested for an awfully long time, I mean, literally years, uh, but more so towards this, this centre, this central road here for, you know, a good number of weeks, Drewsby Avenue months. And there doesn't seem to be too much movement. And then you hear from Russian sources, we're clearing out the Ukrainians into the Western areas. And then yesterday, uh, there were a bunch of uh, claims on, on ISW from U Russian sources saying exactly that and showing video evidence of that. Well, Syriac Maps has now uh, got one of these videos and I don't even remember, I was just saying, look, it just shows smoking buildings and, and whatnot. Well, actually, they geolocated that and said the situation west of Donetsk City is that the Russian forces have begun advancing towards a piggery area north of Marinka under the cover of heavy artillery. So actually, we go back to the beginning of this video and see this is out way out in these sort of, well, not in the sticks, but this is not on the western outskirts. It's not in the, in the centre. And this is artillery fire hitting uh this this building and then they do show you know people running out from there in in a second i think that there, there are people running from there here we go now these are almost certainly ukrainians you know, trying to get away from this place being hit by artillery where is that well actually so here you had these claims saying oh we're, we're taking them out the last vestiges of fortification in in marienka well actually that that video has been geolocated to north, to this piggery, literally uh, so a piggery, a farm there. And the, the buildings you just seen being blown up is that building there. Now, that's being hit with artillery. It doesn't, sh it doesn't mean that there are Russian troops there, but it's just that that building's been taken out by artillery. And that, that, that doesn't move the lines anywhere. It doesn't show that the Russians are at all being um, successful in forcing the Ukrainians out of their out of their fortifications within Marienka. As you can see here, Syriac Maps then has then the Russians advancing here. I'm going to hold fire on that for a bit because I just I want a little bit more confirmation on that. Uh, I'm not doubting Syriac, you know, up front just because, because actually they've been fairly accurate recently. But I just, you know, I think just, I, I want to know that there's something more than just buildings being hit by artillery. So it could be that the Russians have moved here to the north of, of Marienka. That might well be an area of Russian control now. So when the ISW says, for example, here, social media footage published on February the 9th purportedly shows elements of the 5th Brigade of the 1st Army Corps uh, attacking Ukrainian positions near Marienka. And that footnote 27 leads to two different sources. And both those sources are the video I've just shown you. So they are, that they are attacking is unclear as to whether that is on foot or whether it's just artillery like you've seen. So, you know, one has to be quite careful when working out what these claims actually translate to. Okay, let's move on from Marienka to Vukladar. So as we move out here and we come down to um, Vukladar, uh, just to remind you, it's in that sort of corner of this southern Donetsk front line. Uh, there are apparently some gains for the Russians in this area. So Syriac maps show some gains just to the southwest of Pavlivka. Um, and moving up towards that highway. Uh, I will adapt my maps, have a little look at that and see see how to change my maps accordingly. Um, I haven't done that yet. As far as Vukladar is concerned, there's some really in interesting footage and claims coming out there. Well, let's just see what Defmon has to say. Ukrainians have repulsed attacks in the area of Marienka, as we've seen, uh, Prechtivka and Bohoyavlenka. I've asked around and no one seems to have an explanation for that. And that still seems to be the case. So it, it, it's weird that this place behind um, Pavlivka and behind Vukladai is getting mentioned as attacks towards there. And I, again, I did mention that yesterday. I believe the Ukrainian hold the blue area areas while the Russians are trying to advance along the red arrows without success, I might add. And he's got, again, these images that show the amount of shelling. I mean, just look at, look at every dot here is, is a... Is a a piece an artillery round that's landed and when they're darker there are more and more and it's just absolutely insane so this is gives you an idea of the lines of advance that the russians have because and you can tell that from the amount of of shelling there is and then you can see that these datches just to the southeast of and the east of vukladar have been heavily flattened in fact there's claims that they've been flattened by the russians uh and then the the ukrainians are actually holding here between pavlivka and 
uh, Mikilska. So down in this area, there could be Ukrainians uh, fighting there, as according to Defmon. So this is what a column of Russian armament looks like just before it goes to, to its grave, really. So the, this is a Dracula com column, and apparently one in Vukladar. Uh, and you can see there's plenty of troops and there's plenty of equipment here getting ready. You can see those sort of white uh, bits hanging off some of the cannons of those tanks um, and uh, some of the barrels of those tanks. Uh, and you'll see just later what, what happens to these vehicles as there is so much evidence of um, destruction. Uh, so here we have video footage. Uh, with some ACDC uh, and you know lo lots of these columns that are moving around uh, doing their stuff really don't want it to keep playing and then you see it uh, as it is later explosions of these co this column along this column and then like it's just incredible footage of destruction of armament all over the place in in the Vukladar area here as you can see just uh, just dozens of pieces of equipment and when you start you know here's that um that column there and you can see you know troops as well just uh getting hit some of it getting away a lot of it not getting away and when you see the numbers for the ukrainians that the ukrainians produce in the morning for the amount of equipment lost and you see 27 that's quite a famous shot that one that's been doing the rounds when you see sort of 27 apcs and x number of tanks uh this is where it's coming from look at this number of tanks here that that are that are inoperable and you think oh they're just sitting there no actually their tr their tracks are off uh the these tanks are immobile they're inoperable the this is is an equipment graveyard that ain't, unless that unless you have arvs to get those vehicles out there which we are hearing that the russians don't here's a tank with a mine roller on the front then those tanks are staying there and and you know, they are losses for the Russians. Here's a picture of that still I just showed you. Uh, this is 155th, apparently, taking those huge losses. Well, Tatra Gami, who's a good source for um, what's going on in Vukladar, says it's, it's become known to us that the word Vukladar became infamous among occupiers. And when soldiers or officers figure out their unit is being transferred to the Vukladar area, they seek ways to find ways out of it. After devastating losses in previous assaults, the enemy continues daily assaults with small assault groups covered by artillery and tank fire, but with no results. The occupiers continue to move additional units to the Vukladar area. The movement of new units to the Vukladar area hasn't stopped and continues in a non-stop mode since late January. The quality of reinforcements and their assault capabilities remain dubious, but that doesn't mean the enemy won't try another large assault. The initial plan to recapture or to capture, sorry, Vukladar was shattered. The Ukrainian defenders comprised of the 72nd and 68th brigades held against 40th and 155th naval infantry brigade units from the 36th, 37th and 72nd motor rifle brigades, auxiliary units, Cascade and Vostok. PMC, so this is another uh, private military company, another set of mercenaries, a Patriot PMC, bars unit active reserves, separate units from the 136th and other brigades. All of those that I've just listed are fighting to try and take Vukladar and the surrounding area. The enemy, he says, is unlikely to achieve strategic success in the area and will likely continue useless assaults to achieve same some tactical gains while new infantry assault units are training. It's uh, yeah, just not uh, not good for them there. And here we've got another source saying more reviews of the current situation around Vukladar by Russian channels. So these are Russian sources calling it blatant idiocy, someone's stupid order and hell. And in fact, you know, there are lots of translations, um, you know, the Grey Zone, which is a really prominent Russian uh, channel, uh, reacts to the recent losses of the 40th and 155th Naval Brigades um, in the vicinity of Vukladar, mentioning that a F-up is underway there. A, an F-up is underway around Vukladar and it is happening over and over again, often in command of the same units and... Uh, that were raising voice about problems yesterday, but the problems do not end. Yes, of course, we also inflict damage and defeat on the enemy, but videos and photos shared by the enemy demonstrate another crisis in command and control of troops at the headquarters level. Uh, just, yeah, not good for the Russians in Vukladar. There's absolutely no doubt about that. ISW referring back to this reserve officer. Ukrainian reserve officer also reported that the majority ethnic Tatar 
Um, volunteer battalion Alga of the uh, 72nd Motorized Rifle Brigade fought near Vukodar on February the 6th. So the reserve officer suggested the use of volunteer battalions in this area indicates that 155th and 40th Naval Infantry Brigades, which were previously active in the area, sustained uns- insurmountable losses and are being replaced by other formations, what we just heard from Tatragami, uh, Tataragami. Um, Recently posted footage from the Vukhlada area shows a defeated Russian mechanized formation of the 155th that lost 13 main battle tanks and 12 BMP infantry fighting vehicles in a single engagement, about half a Russian tank battalion. The footage shows a Russian formation driving in a column displaying poor tactics and a lack of learning from previous Russian tactical failures. Separate drone, fo- drone footage published on the 8th shows Ukrainian forces striking Russian forces approaching it's just endless footage of this kind of stuff happening otherwise not too much to mention uh, about elsewhere um it, skirmishes going along on some of these areas uh, along the uh, zaporizhia front line uh, Kherson as well you know artillery drills but n- not too much else obviously the big missile attack taking place today uh, the only other thing worthy of note you don't hear too much information about high mile strikes as much as we did maybe weeks back um, but more than 100 troops were killed as a result of February the 8th attack on an airfield in Russian occupied Berdyansk and Berdyansk is just down here uh, so uh, it's quite a prominent port um, they damaged uh, a warehouse, ammunition, f- fuel and lubricants and a radar station, the city's military administration said. Uh, so that is 100 Russian troops killed. That is huge. Um, on, uh, so, yeah, they are active, these high Mars, obviously. Uh, and we just heard news in the last 24 hours that they are hitting exclusively pretty much with... American intelligence so they're not firing their high miles until basically the Americans give them the intelligence to hit the target so it's a really close collaboration between the Americans and the Ukrainian forces um, so there you go that's the frontline update for the 10th of February hope that's useful please like subscribe and share uh, and I'll hopefully get back to you with a uh, another video later today uh, an extra um, and all the ways you can support the channel are in the description below. You don't obviously don't have to, but if you had the wherewithal or, and, and the desire, it's really appreciated and allows me to continue doing so. But anyway, biggest thing is you guys being here and commenting in the superb ways you do in the threads below. Thank you. See you later.